Welcome to episode 353 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Will, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Jeff. Hello, Rainbow Romance readers. It's great to have you here with us. This is the Big Gay Fiction Book Club episode for the month of December. And this month's pick is The Virgin Meets Tattooed Bad Boy Holiday Romance, A Boyfriend for Christmas by Jay Northcote. Before we start our deep dive discussion of this month's book, we'd like to quickly thank the members of our Patreon community. It's because of them that we're able to bring you podcast episodes every single week with interviews from your favorite authors and reviews of some of the best books our genre has to offer. On the Big Gay Fiction Podcast Patreon page, members get early access to the book club episodes and author interviews, as well as an exclusive monthly bonus episode that can't be heard anywhere else. Patrons help keep this podcast running and fund the transcription of the episodes, making sure that this show is accessible to all readers and listeners. If you're in a position to help the podcast grow and would like more information, simply head on over to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. And you're going to want to make sure to stick around after our discussion. We are pleased to bring you an excerpt from the audiobook of A Boyfriend for Christmas with narration from Hamish Long. You are not going to want to miss that. So 21-year-old Archie is fresh out of uni and is decidedly bored at his sister's high-tone engagement party. His mom tries to set him up with Fiona, a nice girl from a nice family. Neither of them are looking for a relationship, and since she is, in fact, nice, they decide to be friends, at the very least for appearances' sake, to keep their matchmaking parents off their backs. On the walk home, Archie sees a gay couple kissing outside a bar and dreams of having someone, anybody, like that in his life. So much about Archie came through in this very opening chapter. Jay does a great job of setting up who Archie is and kind of where he is in his life. And the thing that struck me and just made me go, aw, and wanted to wrap Archie in a hug was this little internal dialogue of his own saying that he was a misfit for no reason. There's a lot of things going on with Archie that will unwrap as we get into this story. But that thing right there tells you a lot about his current mental state. But I have to say, even in these opening moments, I also dearly love Fiona and the fact that they're kind of making this little Christmas pact and she's going to become an awesome friend as this goes along. But yeah, love her too. Cal is a tattooed nice guy who happens to have struck it big in the lottery. One morning, his best mate, Danny, is over and as Cal goes through his mail, opens a swank invitation to a Christmas party thrown by the investment firm that handles all of his money. Fancy hotel, free food, free booze. Danny is intrigued. Cal, less so. But tells his friends that if he wants to go so badly, Cal will take him, but only if they play boyfriends for the night. Fake dating abounds in this book. It's just awesome. And Cal has got to be one of my favorite bad boys ever. He has this bad boy exterior but he is such a marshmallow inside. I'm so enchanted by him. And the even the facade that he puts on around being a bad boy were as he's just really not. I love him so much. Archie is on the steps of the hotel about to go into the party where his father will be making a speech when a motorcycle roars to a stop just past him. The writer and his partner are Archie's tattooed hipster bad boy fantasy come to life. He briefly locks eyes with his dream man before shuffling inside. With a glass of champagne in his hand, he scans the party looking for his siblings, his parents, and Fiona should be there somewhere, when there's a commotion at the entrance. It seems Archie's bad boy will also be attending the party, and has already made quite an impression. His parents do not approve, but Fiona seems intrigued. She thinks bearish Danny is hot. Archie, of course, prefers Cal. Archie and Cal's shared financial advisor waves them over and makes introductions. Fiona just happens to mention their fake arrangement and their mother's apparent enthusiasm for the match, but they'll need to tread carefully or else a grand wedding will soon be in the planning. (laughs) And no one wants that. (laughs) She and Danny step out for a quick smoke, leaving Archie and Cal alone together. There's a super cute moment here where Archie comes out to Fiona. Really the first time he's uttered the words to anybody that he might actually like a guy. And it's so sweet and so innocent and just projects all the more that kind of virginal nice guy person that Archie is. And I could only, I kept having this vision in my head of like the stir that Cal was making in this room with all these really fancy people and him having the bad boy look with Danny along with him. 
I want to see this party turned into a movie. I want to see this play itself out somewhere because the vision in my head was pretty awesome. Archie is shy, but Cal is very interested and thinks this cute posh boy might be as well. When food is served, the foursome sit together and Danny lets slip that he and Cal are not partners. Fiona helpfully gets Cal to clarify that he is indeed gay and very single. This is, of course, for Archie's benefit. She is a seriously good friend. (laughs) And a good matchmaker, too. She's just (laughs) saying all the right things to kind of make this happen. The thing that I was sad about in our little fake dating scenario here is that Danny actually has a girlfriend already. And so we couldn't pair up Cal and Archie and then Danny and Fiona, too, because that would have just been even more awesomeness in this book if Fiona could have gotten that too, because Fiona needs love, man. She needs somebody. You think it should be a movie, and I do too. I think it would be totally amazing. But I also wish that these four people were real, because I would totally hang out with them. They are so much fun. And Jeff will tell you, I don't want to hang out with anybody. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) I'm lucky he wants to hang out with me. (laughs) But yeah, I think these four would be really fun together. And I have to imagine that even on the side that Danny's girlfriend is pretty fun to be in his life. So I'd even sweep up all five of them if necessary to be able to hang out. They talk about Cal's work as a tattoo artist, the work he's done on himself and Danny, and exactly how much of his body is covered in ink. Wouldn't Archie like to know? He's a proud socialist and remarks on how this upper crust soiree is not his usual social scene. He badmouths capitalism in general and the sure-to-be-boring speech forthcoming from Archie's dad. And Archie agrees with Cal completely. Yeah, he, Archie's... The only reason Archie's here is because he was forced by his awful parents. Denny and Fiona slip out for another cigarette, and Cal places his hand seductively on Archie's thigh underneath the table and asks if there's any reason that they can't slip out as well. Archie agrees to meet him in the downstairs bathroom. Maybe there's a little bit of bad boy in Archie, too. So up until this point, Archie has been the quintessential blushing virgin. So when he agreed to do this, I was like, hell yeah, go get him. Carpe diem. Seize that hot bad boy biker. Mm -hmm. So they go downstairs and meet in the farthest stall. Archie admits to his inexperience, like literally none. And Cal says corrupting him is going to be a whole lot of fun. To which Archie agrees that he'll be corrupted completely. (laughs) They kiss, which is mind-altering for Archie. Remember, this is his very first time. Cal gets down on his knees and expertly blows him. They trade places, and Cal gruffly gives orders that Archie is only too happy to obey. Once finished, they head back upstairs. The speech is now over. Not only do I really like that Archie just seizes this moment and goes after what he really wants... But Cal, for all of his bad boyness that he portrays, is actually quite tender here. Yes, there's some bossiness that goes on and everything, but he also is making sure that Archie gets his moment of consent and that he's okay with what happens along the way, even making sure that his clothes don't get too fussed because they do have to go back upstairs. So it is exactly what Archie needs to the bossiness level that he needs but it's also tender and caring in its own way at the same time i really enjoyed how this scene played out archie's mom is none too pleased by his absence during the speech too damn bad he feigns feeling ill and begs off and cal offers to take him home he hops on the back of cal's bike for the short but thrilling ride back to his place they say their good nights and the next morning over toast and coffee they text about meeting up again They make plans, and Cal clarifies that he's not looking for a relationship, which is fine with Archie. He's still mainly in the closet, looking for a little fun and some experience, and Cal can't wait to give him all the experience that he can handle. Archie had quite an evening meeting Cal, getting blown in the toilets, losing his virginity in in regards to that, and then you had a motorcycle ride on top of it. I mean, what a night, and good for him. Date night arrives, and Archie goes to Cal's place. They share a quick drink, kiss, and then go upstairs, eager to do more. Still shy, Archie does manage to ask for what he wants, for Cal to rim and fuck him. He gladly obliges, and goes slowly in consideration of Archie's inexperience. But he's an eager and fast learner, 
and is soon able to take everything that Cal can give. Afterward, Archie is exhausted but elated. Hashtag virgin no more. (laughs) I was impressed with how fast Archie went. I mean, from just losing any aspect of his virginity and then going off the deep end and wanting to get rimmed and fucked. It's like, I guess all that time being a virgin, he was just ready to let it all go. They get cleaned up and watch a little telly while finishing their drinks from earlier. Cal enjoying how easy it is to be comfortable with Archie. He gives him a ride home and makes plans for the weekend. Archie giving him a sweet kiss goodnight before going into his flat. While at work, Cal's mind drifts to thoughts of the holiday, present for his mom, a gay gift for Danny, and if they're still seeing each other, something special for Archie. He's already thinking presents. I love Cal. The level of caring that runs through him, how he takes care of Archie at every moment without being overbearing, even down to the, the finer points of like how to communicate while they're on the bike together. If he needs to slow down or if he needs something, you know, they have all these signals that they've kind of set up for it. You know, you called it a, a bad boy biker thing up front, but it's not that at all because Cal is just the sweetest guy who just happens to be wrapped up in this leather exterior. Yeah, and as you mentioned, bad boy bikers, the next time that they see each other, Cal takes Archie for a ride on his bike. It's really cute because they're both wondering, are they at the dating stage? They're not 100% sure. Are they just hanging out? Is it a date date? They don't know. <laughs> neither one of them is clear. And I, I, neither one of them really wants to label it at this point either for fear it'll be right. moving it in the wrong direction or moving mm-hmm. it too fast, you know. Archie borrows a pair of Cal's leathers. They're baggy, but Cal insists Archie looks cute. So they go out zooming into the countryside, and it's exhilarating. They each enjoy spending time together, and despite Cal's earlier proclamation of nothing serious, he admits taking it slow and seeing where this takes them, it sounds good. Kind of a bit from Archie's point of view that happens while they're hanging out in this bar having having a little bit of food. And essentially the internal monologue says, how is this actually happening? Archie felt as if he'd conjured himself a new reality by sheer force of his longing. And the only way to keep it was by appreciating every tiny detail of the day. If he relaxed or forgot to be grateful to the universe, it might drift away like smoke. Oh, Archie. But yet you for conjuring good things. <laughs> so on the drive back, they stop at a local sex shop. I thought this was particularly hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else could it be when you stop at a sex shop with well, a virgin? <laughs> okay, here, here's the thing. I have no actual concept of what the UK is really like. I've only ever seen it in movies and TV. So when you say quaint English village, I feel like, you know, thatched roofs and twee little houses and stuff like that. So the fact that they end up at this sex shop called Secret Desires, I think is the most hilarious thing ever. Cal explains that he's there to get Danny an embarrassing Christmas gift. It's one of their traditions. Hmm. And what a tradition it is. They really do a number on each other with these gifts that you find out through the book. Archie is a little bit disappointed by this because he thought they might be shopping for the two of them. Cal suggests that he browse for anything that he might like. A pair of tight leather pants catches his eye and he tries them on, wriggling into them. Cal teasingly pulls down the easy access zipper in the back. Oh yeah, he really likes them. (laughs) Archie says he'll think about it and maybe get them later. The shopkeep in this cute little sex store. (laughs) Just egg them on. I know, right? (laughs) Totally best. (laughs) Go ahead, go in there with him. It's fine, just don't make a mess. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Back at Archie's place, they order in and end their day with blowjobs. A 69, to be exact, another exciting first for Archie. And this is another moment, like Jeff pointed out earlier, I really like how, despite his inherent shyness, Archie is really making up for lost time. I'm just like, yeah, you go for it. Yeah. Go get what you want. <laughs> Make up for all that stuff. But I'll, again, I have to point out, because Jay just does a beautiful job of giving us what's going on in Archie's mind. And this is another passage that really caught my attention as they're at the end of this wonderful day that they've had. Possibilities unfurled in Archie's mind, sending out vague and hopeful tendrils as he imagined how his life could be if he could stop being afraid of his sexuality and find the courage to let the world see him exactly as he was. Absolutely. 
As Cal prepares to go, he gives the leather pants to Archie, who insists on paying him back. Cal says he can pay him back by wearing them on their next date. Mm -hmm. And just like that, they are officially dating. Can you wear provocative pants like that out in public? I mean, there is a zipper in the back, after all. I hope it's tucked away <laughs> appropriately so that only the right people come after the zipper. At a tiresome party of Archie's mom's friends, like second cousin, he chats with Fiona, getting her caught up on his fling slash relationship. Fiona is upbeat. I mean, obviously things are going well. The fact that Cal has asked him to lunch with his mom has got to mean things are going in the right direction. And the lunch itself goes really well. Archie and Cal's mom get along like a house on fire. Almost to Cal's uh, displeasure at times because there are stories told and other things. And it's really cute watching how Cal occasionally gets a little bit embarrassed. When the inevitable question of what Archie does comes up, which is temporarily helping at his dad's office, he mentions the idea of starting a nonprofit for queer youth. The first time he's ever spoken about the idea to anybody. And Cal's mom is happy to talk out some of the initial concepts of the idea. And later, back at Archie's place, he decides to make good on a previous promise and models those leather pants for Cal, mm. who is very appreciative. They end up in the bedroom where Cal dictates what they'll do and how they'll do it, just like Archie likes. They make good use of the backdoor zipper, and after they're satisfied and get cleaned up, they order pizza for a Netflix and chill. I've talked a lot so far about Archie's kind of state of mind, and there's a moment that Cal has with his mom that I kind of want to back up on here a second, because... He actually says to her, what the hell is wrong with me? I never normally stress over guys. And his mom says, or his mum, as it's written here in the book, because this is British. And I could just envision this through like some <laughs> of those accents that we hear on the great British baking show. Oh, love, maybe you've never met one who matters enough before. It's like, what a lovely moment between mother and son. And again, you could kind of see in these moments with his mom where Cal gets his overall demeanor and his caringness and everything because his mom is so awesome there's such a dichotomy in this book between cal's mom and archie's parents that i just love i would also want to hang out with cal's mom mm -hmm. archie is going to be away for an extended family holiday between christmas and new year's and is considering coming out to them since the whole family will be there cal is cautiously optimistic but also realistic, what if it doesn't go well? If that is the case, then he'll come rescue Archie, his tattooed knight on Shining Harley. The night before he leaves, they have a quiet evening in, enjoying a joint, savor some particularly amazing ice cream, before retiring to the bedroom, where Archie tries his topping skills for the very first time. Like everything these boys seem to do, it goes very well. <laughs> it is a lovely evening. I have to talk about ice cream for a moment. <laughs> Feel free. Archie's really into ice cream. And the conversation was like chocolate brownie, salted caramel, or both. And then Archie's thinking to himself, because he had to think about this, you see. He liked both, but did he want them in the same bowl? What if there was too much transference of flavor? And then could he really fully appreciate both of them? And he's just left with it. Well, that's difficult. And then ultimately, Cal comes to the rescue with the idea of separate bowls, and they'll just share, and they can sample out of both bowls. <laughs> Poor Archie. He knows exactly what he wants in the bedroom, and will say it, but the ice cream thing throws him. <laughs> it's like, oh, but I totally get the transference of flavor thing, because sometimes you don't want that. So I also related to that. Well, you're totally right. Whether it's the bedroom or the kitchen, Cal is always able to assess the situation and figure out exactly what Archie needs. Yes. If Archie can't actually say it for himself, <laughs> Cal will sort it for him. But after this amazing night, they don't stay amazing for long. In the morning, over coffee, Cal can feel that the mood has changed. Archie has had time to think and is panicked over the thought of coming out over Christmas. In fact, he doesn't think he'll be able to come out anytime soon. So where exactly does that leave them? Cal wants to be as supportive as possible, but can't see a future with someone who's in the closet indefinitely. He doesn't give Archie an ultimatum, like come out or we're through, but he does suggest that they take a break and use the time while Archie is away to think about the future and what they really want. It was the right choice, but my heart just ached. Cal was being very practical and appropriate, giving Archie his space. But it's like, oh, no, no, no. It was only the fact that I was reading a romance that I knew it would all sort out okay. <laughs> that I did not have to totally freak out about this. <laughs> and also, it's clear 
even in this kind of darker moment that neither of them want to break up. Exactly. I was yeah. just going to say that. They don't want to go on a break, but Cal is genuinely trying to be sensitive to what Archie is going through. Everything that they've done in such a short period of time, the idea of being out publicly and to your family. I mean, that's all a lot to handle. So Cal is trying to be a good guy and give Archie his space to work through this stuff. Yeah, it's all the right stuff. It's just like, it's heartache at Christmas time. Yeah, on Christmas Eve, while out with friends, Cal is completely miserable. He asks Danny what he should do. And there's nothing really to do until New Year's and see how he feels when Archie gets back. They exchange their naughty gifts and wish each other a happy holiday. Cal's so cute, saying, I'm assuming I shouldn't open it in front of my mom. And Danny's like, yeah, best not. Christmas Day with Archie and his family is dull and tiresome. During luncheon, his mother mentions a salacious piece of gossip that a friend of the family's husband left her for another man. Archie excuses himself, full of fear and anger at their snobbish homophobia, and that he really doesn't give two fucks what they think anymore. It was kind of his light bulb moment, that whole thing that went down over lunch. When his sister Lottie comes to check on him, he comes out to her, and it's fine by her, but suggests that if he's going to tell the family, he wait until morning when they'll all be a little less surly and far more sober. At the same time, Cal is at his mom's, opening presents and enjoying the big Christmas Day meal she's prepared. When she asks how Archie is doing, he is overcome by how much he misses the guy and that maybe the no contact over Christmas break idea was a bad one. He knows Archie must be going through it right now. He should have been more thoughtful and supportive of what he was going through. He decides that a text, at the very least, is in order. Cal messages him, offering support and wishing him a happy Christmas. I thought Cal beat himself up a little too much here. I mean, they'd kind of mutually decided how they were going to play this. I thought they were both a little extreme in deciding not to talk at all over the break. Because that's not really good for anybody. But since they did come to that decision mutually, I really wanted Cal to cut himself a little bit of a break, which his mom also tried to nudge him towards that, you know, he was doing the best he could in the moment. And now he's had a moment to think more clearly. So I, I was super glad he did the text because it, it turned out to be a well-timed text as well. That text from Cal is everything Archie needs. And he decides that hiding is no longer for him. He heads back downstairs where everyone is watching the Queen's speech and tells them he's gay. He's got a working class boyfriend. He wants to start a queer youth nonprofit. And he's a socialist who votes the Labour Party. <laughs> I don't know which one his family didn't want to hear more. The fact that he was out or the fact that he was a socialist. No, that last bit is what <laughs> horrifies the family the most. Definitely. <laughs> As Lottie drives her brother back to Bristol, Archie can finally call Cal with the details of his coming out. That he's gay with a boyfriend, the whole bit. I adore Lottie. And it should be noted, Lottie's pregnant. And she has left the family on Christmas to drive her brother at least an hour. I think it was an hour, maybe 90 minutes away to get him to Cal. Because Cal, who is going to be the knight on the Harley, unfortunately has had a bit too much to drink in his Christmas celebration. So he's not exactly roadworthy. Lottie's fine because... <laughs> She is pregnant and therefore cannot drink. And she really stepped up for her brother in this case. She really kind of plays the role here that had Fiona been at this party, Fiona would have done these things. <laughs> but yeah, Lottie was a delight. I loved how Archie just threw it all out there, put everything on the table. was like, and now I'm going to go see my man for Christmas. Goodbye to all of you stuffy people. And Lottie, the other thing I really adored about Lottie was as they were getting ready to leave, she was like, that was so epic. I wish I'd videotaped it so you could have seen it for yourself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lottie drops him off at Cal's mom's house. And there's this cute little scene involving the four of them talking about what to expect from motherhood. But our two heroes eventually excuse themselves and celebrate the holiday with mutual blowjobs. Afterwards, Archie realizes to his etiquette-minded horror that he hasn't gotten Cal a Christmas gift, but he assures Archie he has everything he needs. After all, he got a boyfriend for Christmas. It's the perfect little wrap-up. I mean, everything from Lottie and Cal's mom hanging out to that last scene. And I love Cal because he's just like, yeah, I got a boyfriend for Christmas. He even says, seriously, there isn't anything money could buy 
that could be a better present than that. Are you satisfied now? As if to make sure that Archie was 100% okay with the fact that he was, in fact, the best present. In an epilogue a few months later, Cal meets Archie's father for the first time at a proper upper crust spring garden party for his 60th birthday. And all preconceptions aside, Archie himself is surprised at how welcoming his dad is. Yeah, this was a little bit of a surprise, how well received Cal actually was, which just goes to show that maybe it was that whole socialist thing that was really the biggest bomb dropped back during the coming out. There's a really humorous thing that happens here as well. A couple of the kids who belong to some of Archie's siblings catch the ink that's on Cal's arms and they actually go off and get marker and draw ink on themselves, proudly pronouncing that, look, look, I've got pictures like Cal. Nothing at all to do with the story, but it struck me as absolutely hilarious the way that Cal has started to integrate himself into this family by, you know, essentially being a bad influence on the kids now drawing tattoos on themselves. I absolutely adored this book. Jay just wrote one of the most perfect Christmas romances, A Wonderful British Christmas, and introducing us to such warm and awesome people like Fiona and Cal's mom and Lottie. There were so many great side characters here, too. And Danny as well. I can't leave him out. Danny was also a super good friend to Cal. It was just kind of a perfect little book for me. Yeah, so many wonderful tropes perfectly packed into a single story. Virgin and bad boy and holiday themes. Is Cal really a bad boy? Yes, he's got tattoos. <laughs> yes, he rides a Harley. 100%. It counts. He, he's just not a gruff bad boy. We hope that you've enjoyed our discussion of Jay Northcote's A Boyfriend for Christmas. And if you haven't read it yet, we hope that you'll consider giving this book a try. And just a reminder for you to stick around after the closing music for chapter three from the audiobook of A Boyfriend for Christmas. And why chapter three instead of chapter one, you might ask? We wanted to bring you that chapter because it's where Archie and Cal meet, and it's so super good. All right, I think that'll do it for now. Coming up on Monday in episode 354, it's our 2021 wrap-up as we talk about our favorite books from the past year. This is the list that I've been making and checking it twice over the past couple of weeks. <laughs> Definitely looking forward to talking about what we liked best for the year. On behalf of Jeff and myself, we want to thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you'll join us again soon for more discussions about the kind of stories that we all love, the big gay fiction kind. Until then, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Production assistance by Tyson Greenan. Original theme music by Daryl Banner. Now we're proud to present the third chapter of A Boyfriend for Christmas by Jay Northcote, read by Hamish Long. A big thanks to Jay for allowing us to bring this to you. This excerpt is copyright 2019 by Jay Northcote, production copyright 2020 by Jay Northcote. Chapter 3 Archie dragged his heels as he walked the last stretch towards Goldney Manor Hotel. After a long day of Christmas shopping in the crowded city centre, the last thing he felt like doing was spending the evening surrounded by yet more people. He wished he could have stayed in his flat, curled up on the sofa with a mug of hot chocolate and Netflix. Maybe one day he'd have the guts to stand up for himself and stop doing everything his parents demanded of him. He was no longer dependent on them, even without a job. Since turning 21, he had money from a trust fund left to him by his grandmother, which assured him financial security without any help from his parents. But old habits die hard. Archie still desperately wanted their approval and feared their judgement, so... Here he was. The only bright spot in his gloomy mood was that Fiona was going to be there tonight too. They'd messaged each other a bit since last weekend and had strengthened the tentative bond they'd forged. Archie was looking forward to seeing her in person again tonight. As he neared the front of the hotel, a motorbike roared past him and screeched to a halt at the edge of the cobbled street. There were two riders, sinister looking in their dark clothing with helmets obscuring their faces. Archie slowed his pace, admiring the sleek lines of the powerful machine as the riders climbed off. The doorman of the hotel was showing an interest too, watching them warily as they took off their helmets. The first guy, they were both men, ran his hands through his hair and turned to the other one. 
Is that okay, or do I still have helmet hair? It looks bloody perfect, as always. They had their backs to Archie, so he couldn't see their expressions, but there was teasing humour in the other man's tone. Come on, princess. You ready to do this? Hang on. The first man turned, scoping out the street. Archie froze, and his eyes widened as the man's face came into view, and a thrill of excitement rippled through him. Oh, good lord, he's devastating. If the universe created a man to suit Archie's exact preferences, this guy would be it. He looked like one of the edgy hipster models Archie drooled over on the internet. Dark hair, almost shaved to the skin at the back and sides, merged into a thick quiff on top. Silver piercings glittered in both ears, and he had a ring in his eyebrow too. Dressed from head to toe in black leather, he was sex on legs. Archie might have been short on experience, but he was a master at fantasy. And in Archie's head, he was already on his knees with his dream guy's cock in his mouth. The man's gaze finally lit on Archie, and when he noticed Archie staring, their eyes locked and his expression hardened. Galvanised by fear, Archie looked away quickly and jerked back into movement. Head down, he scurried past the two men to the safety of the hotel. Good evening, sir, the doorman said smoothly as he entered. Evening. Archie gave him a nod. He stopped by a huge Christmas tree in the foyer, tastefully decorated in gold and silver, and looked around until he spotted a sign informing him that the Morgan Striker event was in a function room on the first floor. Forgoing the lift, Archie took the stairs briskly to burn off some of the adrenaline that was whizzing around his veins. He could still feel the weight of his dream man's stare. Threatening yet thrilling, it lingered in his consciousness, making him jumpy. When he reached the doorway that led into the function room, he had his invitation at the ready just in case. But as soon as he said his name, the man on the door simply waved Archie past with a bright smile and ticked something on his clipboard. Well, good evening, Mr. Arendale. Do come in. May I take your coat, sir? A young woman approached, equally courteous. Of course, thank you. Archie unbuttoned his thick woolen coat and handed it to her in exchange for a cloakroom ticket. Champagne. A man with a tray of glasses appeared as if by magic at Archie's elbow. Lovely, thanks. Archie took a drink and moved cautiously away from the door. The room was well lit for an evening party, but Archie was an expert at keeping out of sight when he needed to. At these events he always liked to try to suss out who was there before anyone spotted him. Then he'd know who he wouldn't mind chatting to and who he wanted to avoid at all costs. He found a vantage point in an alcove, not far from the door, where he was partially screened by an enormous potted plant. Getting his phone out so he could pretend he was occupied doing something, he scanned carefully around, looking for familiar faces. He spotted his parents first, deep in conversation with another couple on the other side of the room. Busy looking out for his siblings, and Tim, his financial advisor, Archie's attention was suddenly caught by a male voice, sharpened by an edge of frustration. I've shown you my invitation, isn't that enough? The accent was local, lacking the polished public school vowels that Archie was used to hearing in his social circles. The voice seemed familiar, but surely Archie must be mistaken. He turned to see if he could catch sight of the speaker, but they were still on the outside of the door and out of Archie's view. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm sure you understand that security is important at these types of events. If you could just show me some form of identification... The man on the door was using a tone that was almost obsequiously polite, but his body language was tense, and he'd positioned himself so that the new arrival wouldn't be able to get past him easily. I didn't notice you asking the bloke who went in ahead of us for ID. This was a different voice again. It had the same local accent as the first, but the tone was deep and distinctive, and this time Archie knew for certain that he'd heard it just minutes before. Come on, princess. You ready to do this? His stomach did a cartwheel of excitement. Yeah, well, the bloke ahead of us looked the part, didn't he? Archie's dream guy said, sounding thoroughly pissed off. Good thing I've got my driving license with me. Oh, relax, I'm going for my wallet, not a weapon. Here you go, my name's Callum Turner, check your list, I'm on it. And this is Daniel Roach, my partner. Archie wondered what business these guys ran together. Whatever it was, they must be very successful. There was a pause. Satisfied now? Yes, of course, Mr. Turner. I'm so sorry for the confusion. 
The man with the clipboard moved aside so quickly, he almost fell over his feet as he ushered them through. You can leave your coats and your... other accessories with my colleague there. Archie ducked farther back into his alcove, praying the plant hid him well enough, because there was no way he was going to pass up the opportunity to ogle Callum Turner again. His fingers were sweating where he was still clutching his phone. He's utterly perfect. Feeling like Romeo when he clapped eyes on Juliet for the first time, Archie drank in every delicious detail. In the better lighting, he could appreciate the chiselled features and intense brown eyes. May I take your helmets and jackets for you? The young woman on cloakroom duty failed to hide her fascination, and Archie could hardly blame her. Both men were striking by any standards, but they stood out from the other occupants of this room like a couple of panthers in a cage full of pussycats. Callum handed his helmet to the girl and then took off his gloves and unwound a scarf from around his neck. Archie noticed with a thrill that the backs of his hands were tattooed with black stars in varying sizes, and then he spotted the tendrils of black ink that crawled up Callum's neck like a vine, stopping just below his jawline. Archie stared in wonder. Could he be any more perfect? Apparently he could because as Callum slipped his jacket off, he revealed muscular arms that were covered with complex multicoloured designs depicting leaves and flowers, birds and animals, faces and symbols. Archie longed to study them and trace his fingers over the lines of ink. The other chap, Daniel, was it? Archie had been too focused on Callum to be sure, was fiddling with his tie. I'm sure this not has slipped. He was dressed more conventionally than Callum, in a cheap-looking suit and tie. But his shaved head, bushy beard and piercings, particularly one that went through his nose like a bull, meant that nobody would be paying much attention to his clothes. Callum stepped in close. Here, hon, let me help you with that. He batted Daniel's hands away. The words were spoken casually, but he might as well have tossed a grenade in Archie's direction. The world exploded around him, settling in pieces that formed a new and wonderful pattern. Hun, he's gay. Then he recalled Callum's description of Daniel as his partner, and the lens shifted again. Archie checked himself quickly, forcing down the hope that was welling up. Of course, they're a couple. The idea that this god among men swung his way was still somehow thrilling, perhaps because it meant Archie was still theoretically and with a chance, in some parallel universe where he wasn't a hopeless virgin with no confidence and where Callum was single. But even if he was in the business of splitting up happy couples, Archie didn't fancy getting on the bad side of Callum's boyfriend. He was built like a gladiator, whereas Archie would blow away in a stiff breeze. He deflated as cold reality trickled in, dousing the momentary flare of excitement. The two men were almost nose to nose as Callum tightened his boyfriend's tie and then patted him lightly on the cheek. All done? Thanks, babe. Something flared in Daniel's eyes that Archie couldn't identify. Callum moved away. You ready for a drink? The bear's shit in the woods, Daniel said loudly, attracting a few surprised glances from people on their side of the room. A female server approached them, tray in hand. Would you like a glass of champagne, sir? Wicked, thanks, mate. Callum took two. Here you go, Danny. Cheers. He drained the glass in one swallow and reached over Callum to grab another. Thanks, darling. He winked. They looked so out of place among the rich and privileged clients of Morgan Stryker, and as they gradually caught people's attention, it was like watching a field of corn rustle and move with the breeze. Muttering spread, and more and more faces turned for a covert or blatant, in some cases, inspection of the new arrivals. Archie cringed with second-hand embarrassment as he imagined how he'd feel with all those eyes watching him. But these two seemed unperturbed as they stood side by side, facing the room. Excuse me, can I just... <sighs> thanks. Tim Clifton, Archie's financial advisor, squeezed between two large ladies as he emerged from the throng. Cal, how wonderful to see you. His smile was broad as they shook hands. I'm glad you could make it. All right, Tim, how's it going? Super, thanks. Are you well? Yeah, I'm grand. 
Carl put a hand in the small of Danny's back. This is my partner Danny. Danny, this is Tim, who manages my account. If Tim was surprised by their relationship, he hid it well as he shook Danny's giant paw. Danny, it's a pleasure. Likewise. Carl slid his hand a little lower and patted Danny on the arse. The casual gesture sent a pang of envy through Archie, sharp and raw enough that he didn't want to see any more. Determined to stop torturing himself with impossible daydreams, he put his phone back in his pocket and went to greet his parents. Might as well get that over with. Oh, hello, Archie. His mother greeted him as he joined their group. Good evening, mother. He kissed her cheek and then shook his father's hand. Father, how are you both? Well, well, thank you, his father replied. You remember the Cassons, I'm sure. He gestured to the couple standing with them. They used to come over to play tennis with us before your mother broke her wrist and had to give it up. You used to be a ball boy for us sometimes, as I recall, Mrs. Casson smiled. Such fun. Of course. Archie remembered being forced to run around for hours on hot sunny days collecting tennis balls from the edges of the court. He'd hated every minute of it. Did you see those fellows who just arrived? Archie's mother asked him in a stage whisper. I was sure they must have come to the wrong function room, but Tim seems to know one of them. Look. She gazed over Archie's shoulder. Mr. Cassan smirked. They're not your typical Morgan Striker clients, are they? His drawling tone dripped with condescension. I wonder what the story is there. Archie's mother was staring in fascination. Maybe they robbed a bank or sell drugs. It's bound to be something dubious, surely. Mrs. Cassan gave a high, tinkling laugh that set Archie's teeth on edge as much as her words. Well, given that our ancestors got rich by stealing land and exploiting the peasants, I'm not sure we're in any position to judge. The words popped out before Archie had time to check himself. There was an awkward pause before his father gave an uneasy chuckle. Well, true enough, I suppose. Catching sight of Fiona arriving gave Archie the perfect excuse to escape before he said anything else he might regret. Oh, look, there's Fiona. She told me she'd be here tonight. I must go and say hello. Oh, yes. His mother looked excited at this new development. Don't let us keep you. I'll see you later. Good luck with the speech, father. Fiona's smile was wide and genuine as she noticed him approach. Hi, Archie. She pulled him into a tight hug. You're a sight for sore eyes. Hi, how are you? Not bad, thanks. Let me grab a drink, then we can find somewhere to sit and catch up. Unless you've already got a table. No, not yet. The room was set up for a buffet with long side tables, where servers were beginning to put out food and circular tables with six chairs each. There was no seating plan. Half the point of the evening was to make new business connections, so the organisers wouldn't want people stuck in one place for the duration of the party. They chose a table at the back, near Archie's alcove. Despite his earlier intention to put Cal out of his mind, Archie took a seat that allowed him to see Cal, although he wasn't quite close enough to overhear the conversation. Still talking with Tim, Cal and Danny were holding hands casually, like it was nothing unusual at all. Fiona followed his gaze. Gosh, who are those guys? They look much more interesting than the usual regulars at these events. They do, don't they? I have no idea. I've never seen them before. They're seriously hot. Fiona studied them over the rim of her glass. Especially the one with the shaved head. Well, I prefer the other one. It was clearly Archie's night for speaking without thinking. An icy rush of anxiety swept his breath away as he realised what he'd said. Fiona didn't even glance his way. Yeah, he's very attractive too, but a little too hipstery for me. I like my men even more rough around the edges. When Archie didn't reply, she turned to look at him. What's up with you? I... Archie swallowed hard looking around nervously to see who might be able to hear them. Leaning in closer, he said quietly, I've never admitted to anyone before that I'm... that I like men. She grinned. Seriously? Well, good for you. How does it feel to say it out loud? As Archie held her gaze, a warm feeling slowly swept in, chasing away the cold fear of before. Okay, I think. 
but I'm not ready to tell anyone else. My lips are sealed. Archie was about to thank her, but was interrupted by a shriek of excitement. Oh my God, Fee, is that you? A voluptuous girl with long strawberry blonde hair was bearing down on them at high speed. Oh, bollocks, Fiona muttered. It is. It's been an age since I saw you. I think it must have been at Julian's 21st birthday bash. How have you been? As she reached their table, she leant down to hug Fiona effusively in a jingle of gold bracelets and a waft of too much perfume. I'm fine, thanks, Catriona. How's life with you? She took the seat next to Fiona. Absolutely brilliant, thank you. Are you still based in Bristol? I've been working in London for Gucci. It's really exciting. And I've been dating Dickon, Serena's brother. Remember him? He's still utterly divine. She rambled on, totally ignoring Archie and not letting Fiona get a word in. Archie's attention drifted back to Cal's group. After a moment or so, Tim caught him looking and his face lit up in recognition. He waved to Archie and then gestured for him to join them. Archie's stomach exploded with butterflies at the thought of meeting Cal, but it was too good an opportunity to pass up. Excuse me, ladies, he said as he stood. I'll leave you to chat. You obviously have lots to catch up on. Catriona glanced at him in surprise as though only just noticing he was there, while Fiona shot him a reproachful glare. Archie took a deep breath, his heart a wild drumbeat in his chest, he ran a hand through his hair, hoping he looked his best, and then he walked over to greet Tim. Archie, hello. Tim gave him the usual warm handshake before turning to the other men. This is another of my clients, Archibald Arendale. Archie, meet Cal Turner and his partner Danny. Hello. It's a pleasure to meet you. Archie offered his hand to Danny first, then to Cal. Thankful for the years his parents had spent schooling him in good manners, he managed to maintain his composure as Cal took his hand in a strong grip and held his gaze. All right, Archibald? His lips quirked with something that could have been amusement. Or do you prefer Archie? Archie, thanks. He tried not to snatch his hand away, but the rough warmth of Cal's palm was doing dangerous things to his libido. He hadn't had an embarrassing erection in public since he was about fourteen, and he didn't want to ruin that streak. Cal's been with Morgan Stryker for over a year now, but this is the first time he's graced us with his presence at one of our social functions. Tim clapped Cal on the shoulder. About time you've dipped your toe in the water. We don't bite, do we? He smiled at Archie, who managed a weak grin back. Archie's family have been involved with us for years, of course. Of course. Carl said smoothly. His tone was utterly serious, but Archie couldn't help the feeling that he was taking the piss. There was a pause. Right, Tim said briskly. If you'll excuse me, I should circulate. Enjoy the evening, chaps. He whisked away, already catching the eye of the next person he wanted to talk to. Left alone with Carl and Danny, all Archie's social skills deserted him. Danny was looking around the room, seemingly fascinated by everything that was going on, but Cal was still studying Archie. Those brown eyes raked over him like curious fingers poking and assessing. So, Archie, you were regular at these sort of things then? I suppose. He gave a nervous shrug. What do you think of it so far? It's pretty much what I expected. Cal's expression indicated that his expectations had been low rather than high. I made him come, Danny said, winking at Archie. He nudged Cal. The miserable git needed a lot of convincing. Apparently free booze and food wasn't enough of a draw. Speaking of booze... He drained the last mouthful in his glass and looked around for a server, catching the eye of a girl with a tray who approached immediately. Nice one, thanks. Danny helped himself to another. Anyone else? Yes, please. Archie's glass was nearly empty, and he could do with more alcohol to chase away some of his nerves and awkwardness. Thank you. Go on, I'll have one more, Cal said, and then added to Archie. I'm driving, so that's my limit. I noticed, Archie said. Oh, right, that was you outside then. I thought it might have been, but I wasn't sure because it was pretty dark out there. His expression softened into a devastating smile. Sorry I gave you a dirty look. I get a bit twitchy if I notice someone staring at my bike. 
Entranced by the new warmth in Cal's eyes, Archie couldn't look away. That's absolutely fine. I imagine you get a lot of admiring looks. He added quickly. Admiring your bike, I mean. His cheeks heated with a blush. Something surfaced in Cal's expression that made Archie's heart beat faster. A flare of interest that reminded Archie of the focused attention of a hunter watching his prey. Surely it had to be a product of Archie's overactive imagination, because Cal was with Danny, and Danny was right there beside him. I imagine you get a lot of admiring looks too. Cal's words left no room for doubt, and his smile lingered, teasing and confusing. I... um... Archie couldn't compute what was happening. Was Cal deliberately messing with him, like a cat playing with a mouse? Not really, he finished lamely. He glanced nervously at Danny to see him watching them, an amused grin curving his lips. Oh my god. Maybe they were one of those couples who had an open relationship. Was Cal flirting with him because they both wanted to... Hi, Archie. Mind if I join you? Fiona's voice snapped him out of his panicked whirlwind of thoughts before his brain imploded. Sorry to barge in, but I just escaped from that witch, Catriona, and my mother was looking my way, and I'm absolutely not ready to deal with her till I've got more booze inside me. She slipped neatly into the group and stuck out a confident hand towards Cal. Hello, I'm Fiona. Hi, Fiona. I'm Cal. And I'm Danny. He grinned as they shook. Want me to grab you another drink? She'd arrived empty-handed. That would be wonderful, thanks. Danny ducked out of the group for a moment to pick up a glass from a tray that had been left on a nearby table. Here you go. Thanks, Danny. You're an angel. Fiona took a huge swig. Although, frankly, there isn't enough booze in the world to get me through evenings like this. Turning to Archie, she added, At least now my mother thinks there's something going on with us. She's not trying to introduce me to every eligible bachelor, divorcee or widower under the age of 50. I just need to work out how to stop her getting too carried away or she'll be planning our non-existent wedding before you know it. Archie chuckled. Oh, Lord. What did you tell her? Only that we've been texting. Apparently that's akin to a proposal. She rolled her eyes and then took another slug of champagne. Have you said anything to your mother? Nothing specific, but I used your arrival as an excuse to ditch her earlier and there was a definite gleam in her eye. Hmm. We need to be careful then. Fiona frowned. Maybe we can keep it going over Christmas and then fake a breakup once the worst of the party season's over. Sounds like a plan. Archie didn't want to get too embroiled in deception, but it would be a relief to get his mother off his back for a while at least. Fiona took another sip of her drink and then said, God, I could kill for a cigarette right now. I'm supposed to be giving up, but alcohol always makes me want one. To be honest, I miss the excuse to lurk outside for a while as much as I miss the nicotine. Want to join me? Danny asked. I was just thinking about nipping out for a fag. Archie's stomach lurched with alarm at the thought of being left alone with Cal. Fiona's eyes lit up. I'd love to, thanks. OK, have I abandoned you for a few? Danny said to Cal, who shrugged. Archie will look after you, I'm sure. Fiona gave Archie a mischievous grin. We'll leave you in his capable hands. I'm sure I'll cope, Cal replied dryly. See you in a bit, then. With that, Danny offered his arm to Fiona, and they headed for the door.